Thanks, Melissa. Thanks to I, th I want to thank the organizers for for uh, the opportunity to give this talk. And so this will be uh, about a paper me and I um, wrote. And um, so. Um, Beta Ansatz is, um, well, as I say here, is the art and science of finding uh, spectra in, and also eigenfunctions in quantum integrable systems. And this is a very, very old subject. The paper by Beta himself is uh, nearly 100 years old. And um, many people worked on the subject since. Here is a, somehow some, some subset of those that personally influenced my thinking about the subject. Um, I want to say from the beginning that this is, I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert in this field. This is, uh, uh, for me, this is the first paper in which Beta Ansatz appears. And so I'm not, I'm not going to give you any kind of historical overview. I'm just, like I said, this is, uh, I'm just going to give you my own take or mean a nice take on the subject. And um, so, uh, so I uh, will go over, um, We'll go over the, the statement of the problem, and then and I'll explain how this is solved. And so, uh, what is a quantum group? And uh, more precisely, we will be talking about quantum loop algebras. And uh, what is this object? If I have a, a Lie algebra G, which is, which is could be, uh, you should think of this a very abstract Lie algebra. Uh, then, of course, so. From the very beginning, I want to say that this is uh, in um, somehow to, to there's there's a there are different points. If you say Lie algebra, there are different points of view what the Lie algebra is, and uh, maybe for some practitioners, if you you, know, you think if you understand Lie algebra JLN, you understand any Lie algebra. But this is uh, this is not the point of view here because the um, here the Lie algebra is really is really some 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 really complicated Lie algebra, not not JLN. Beta and thus for JLN has been sorted out for for some time now. Uh, so anyway, so if I have Lie algebra, then uh, then I can consider the Lie algebra of Laurent polynomials with values in this Lie algebra. It's again a it's again a Lie algebra by uh, point-wise or, or term-wise commutator. It will be noted G hat. And this object has representations of, uh, as a category of representation of the following kind, that if I, uh, so if I have Laurent polynomial, then the first thing I can do is an evaluate as the sum value of T, so T, let's say T equals A1. Or maybe is there, is this thing, No, this is not pointing. How about this one? This is not pointing either. Oh, no, it is. It, mm, OK. Oh, they're both pointing. OK. Not exactly great luminosity, but. <laughs> so if I have a parameter, I can evaluate some value of A. And then, so then I get the Lie algebra element, and then I can act in some representations you want. And so then I can take a bunch of those and tender them together. Those will be a representation of this Laurent polynomial algebra. And a, and a quantum loop algebra is quite simply an algebra whose uh, representation, I mean, somehow the, the category of representation is a deformation of this category. And the interesting aspect of this deformation is that the tensor product is no longer commutative. At least, no longer obviously commutative, because here, here, if it tensor them in some order, it's obviously isomorphic to taking tensor product in any other order. So you just permute the factors, and here, this module, like the permutation of the factor, is not an intertwiner. It's not. It's not an isomorphism. And uh, so this is um, this is an interesting aspect, but <coughs> it's not. If you have a um, if you have a, um, you have two isomorphic objects, you think, 
well, maybe there's still isomorphic after deformation, only the isomorphism is non-trivial. And that is the case here, in that so if I have a tensor product of two, of two objects like this, it is for generic A1 and A2, for generic values of A1 and A2, it really is isomorphic. And there is, a, in other words, there is an intertwiner. There's no trivial intertwiner in my, uh, between these two representations. But that intertwiner depends rational. It's a rational, it depends, depends on this, uh, this ratio of A1 over 2 is a rational function. And that rational function really has zeros and poles for those values of A1 and A2 when, this, when those two modules are not re really not isomorphic. And so historically, this, this, this object first uh, arose in, in uh, so this may be familiar to you, in the context of, of uh, vertex models in statistical mechanics and 2D statistical mechanics. And there in the vertex model, you have some degrees of freedom labeled by V, V1 or V2, living on, a, on edges of a graph. And there is an interaction term at the vertex, so which, is, which is some four-valent tensor. This is called the R matrix. So this is. And so, since you have when you have um, when you have three factors, then uh, then there's you can you can put them in opposite order in, in, in two different ways, and the condition that the corresponding intertwiners really are equal on the nose is the Young-Baxter equation, which is uh, which is uh, you know when you when you enter the Simon Center of uh, geometry and physics, there's on the wall they have. Uh, the most powerful equation in math and physics, like E equals MC squared and uh, Maxwell's equations, and also they have the Young Baxter equation, which is right there. So it's a very, well, it's a very important equation. And, um, and the point of view, which is, uh, which is in math, you typically uh, credit to uh, uh, the work of Adir Prashadik and Tajan, is that you don't really need to know. What a, what a quantum group is. All you need is a is a collection of these R matrices, and then you can reconstruct the quantum group. And this you can do in some hybro way or some pedestrian way. In the pedestrian way, the 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 operators of quantum groups are just metric elements. So if I have a if I take if I take a if an operator in tensor product, if I take its matrix element in one of the factors, this is an operator from the quantum group. In a, in a more uh, if you're more if you want to think more categorically, then if it, the, the R matrix is defined for your braided tensor category, and you can abstractly prove that so any such category is a category of representation of some of some Hopf algebra. So, so now, so now in every in every module in this category, we'll now construct a, a, a set of commuting operators, or rather, Buxer will, has has constructed. A set of commuting operators, and this goes like this. So, if I imagine, if I so, if I have some representation v, then uh, then what will I do? I will braid it with some auxiliary. I choose some auxiliary representation. So that auxiliary representation w has its own auxiliary representation u, evaluation parameter u, and I, so I'll braid it. I put this R matrix between the physical space v and the auxiliary space w. And then I, I, this, this circle here means I take the trace over W. Before I take a trace, however, I can act by some operator Z, which I'll specify in a second. And so this will be, I'm taking the trace over auxiliary space, so I'm getting a, an operator. This is a special case of construction we just discussed. So if I have a, an operator in a tensor product, and I take some matrix element in, the, in one of the spaces, so I get an operator in the other space. Here I take the trace in, a, in, the, in, in auxiliary space after applying some operator z. And then, so then I get an operator in v. And, and very generally, one can show that if z is a, is a diagonal matrix in my quantum group, or, or more categorically, if it's a, a group-like element in the quantum group, means if it acts on the tensor product by z tensor z, then, uh, then these operators, and this is Baxter's fundamental discovery, that these operators commute for, so if I fix z, then uh, these operators commute for all, for all w and all u. <coughs> and, and the context in which this is, uh, for, again, probably most familiar to you is that uh, that of a spin chain, and in a spin chain that z means that if I have a, if I have a, I have a quasi-periodic boundary conditions for my spin, means if I go around 
the back side of that cylinder, I come back, my spins are twisted by some operator Z, which sits in the, which sits in the, which sits in the Cartan, in Cartan of my quantum group. This is this is completely general. So this is a, this, <coughs> the this representation W, you know, maybe anything, maybe infinite dimensional. Since I take the trace, since I multiply by Z, that'll typically, that'll typically that make that trace converge. And so right, so then we have so we have commuting operators, and the, the problem is to write eigenfunctions and eigenvectors. That's that's the that's the question of bet ansatz. And the textbook bet ansatz refers to the case where uh, where the my Lie algebra is SL2. The tensor product is uh, an n fold tensor product of its defining representation. The degrees of freedom in the defining representation are interpreted as a, as a, as, a, as two states of a, of a Spin one half particle can have be have spin up or spin down, and so this is this the um, the configuration space for a spin chain of length n. This is the tensor product, and then and then the um, this commuting this commuting set of operators includes uh, will include the uh, the Hamiltonian of the XXZ model or the six vertex model. So maybe textbook is uh, slightly ambitious. I these days, or maybe maybe in any age, good students don't really read textbook. They reinvent, they reinvent the material in textbooks for themselves in some different context. This is very much what's happening with the field now. People don't really study what's been done in in this context. People somehow invent their own way of thinking about it. This is going to be also be the case for this talk. So <coughs> don't be. <laughs> Don't be embarrassed if you haven't read any textbooks on this on this on this very beautiful subject. Which you. So, um, and like I said, the challenge is to do it for very general Lie algebras, and that will include infinite dimensional Lie algebras. In which case, the integrable. So, for spin chains, the interest is to have a chain long, but for an infinite dimensional algebra, already, already, uh, once on the one side, you can have a very interesting. Very interesting space, like you can have uh, like some kind of hydrodynamic equation just sitting on one side, and if you have several of them, that means you have some multi-layer liquids interacting in some complicated way. So, uh, <coughs> okay, I forgot this. That's in the So, and in fact, there is a more general problem, and this is this is the more general problem we will solve, is to solve a certain Q-difference equation. And now, Q is not a letter we've seen before. Uh, at least not in a, not in the math context. Maybe I had used some English words that had Q in them. So my deformation parameter for a quantum group was you know that H bar Q is some completely different animal, and uh, this Q difference equation is is just this will be instead of an eigenvalue problem for an element of the stand such tensor product, there will be some Q difference equation where Q is unrelated to anything we've seen before. In, in this, in this, again, in in spin chains, the Q is related to H bar, but this is not, this is this is not the case here. <coughs> and there is this. Concretely, we want to look at this what's called the quantum energy zimologic of equation. And this, so this is, um, this is an equation for unknown function psi of arguments a one through a n. It takes value in this tensor product, which means it takes value in. I mean, this is a. This is a vector space, which is isomorphic to tensor product of B1 through Vn, and A1 are just labels that uh, that uh, that go along to remind us what the R matrices are. And the equation reads that if I want to shift, if I want to shift my variable, say the first variable by Q, what I do is I bring. So again, I imagine I'm on the cylinder. I have my first strand corresponds to carries that label V1. I take this strand, I take it all the way around the cylinder. In the process, I braid it, I have to braid it v1 with v2 and so forth, v1 with vn. And then as I come around, I also get to get to act by z, like we acted in this Baxter situation. And so then this, this combination should give me psi back. And the way to think about it is that, is that the Cartan, the Cartan Subgroup of uh, of a quantum loop algebra is the Cartan of the original algebra, which is where Z lived. 
but it also has this loop rotation variable. You had the variable, that we had the variable t, and that variable t we could rescale. That would be again, a, this would be an element in the maximal torus of, of this bigger Lie algebra. And, 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 and what happens here is that I go around, I act not by just an element of the finite carton, I act by an element of the, of the affine carton. means I, I, I both act by z, which happens here, and I shift the, ver the evaluation variable. And so this is, this is an object of the same kind, but the way it's, it's an operator, but acts by a difference operator. It's not, this difference operator is commute for the exact same reason that uh, this Baxter operator is commute. And uh, so this uh, commuting difference operators uh, that, uh, that uh, as, as stated, were written by uh, Frank and Rush Tichin. Very similar operators, of course, known in the context of study of form factors and integrable models, and particularly notably in the work of Fyodor Smirnov. And <coughs> there are the, the beauty of the situation that there are commuting difference equations every single parameter you see. So in particular, you can, there's a commuting difference equation in the variable z, and that those are known as dynamical equations studied by many people. Um, and of course, if I have an equation of this form, uh, where q is unrelated to anything else I've seen, then as q goes to 1, I'm obviously going to get an eigenvalue problem. That's a value. So, and that will, be, that will specialize, that will specialize to, uh, to beta on that question. And uh, generalization of, uh, of the question of beta ansatz is the search for, uh, for integral solution of the QKZ. So namely, <coughs> suppose we want to solve, so QKZ is, a, is an equation for vector valued function, and there, so there's be an index alpha that reminds us that this is a vector valued function. And this alpha entry of number psi would like to find in the form that this is an integral in variables x. x are the integration variables. So again, these are, these are, I mean, so far they're dummy integration variables. They're not, they not any variables you've seen before. And, <coughs> and the integral has two parts. First, there's some fixed kernel function that includes all the variables we, we have. So it includes so the integration variable x, also the variable z, a, h bar, whatever, q. And then, and then that fixed kernel function we want to integrate against um, against some 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 function that now depends on alpha and then and it just it records the representation means it has the axis and it has the a's because a's were the a's um, doesn't depend on any on any uh, on any other variables so <coughs> in other words we need uh, so this is uh, and and the the q going to one limit in this integral will be the stationary phase limit in that this, this kernel as q goes to 1, this kernel will have the form that this will be an exponential of 1 over log q, so this is something that blows up as q goes to 1, times some, some action function s. And then the, how we're going to read off, how we're going to read off the beta ansatz from uh, the uh, saddle point asymptotic of this integral is that, <coughs> well, Obviously, uh, obviously the saddle points are the critical points of S. So there'll be equation on the integration variable x that says that the, this uh, the there has to be axes have to be a critical point of that function S, and this will be the beta equation. Beta ansatz has some has some um, beta ansatz has some uh, uh, some 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 things called beta roots. They've uh, they've uh, they, you can think of this auxiliary variables in the ver in, in the problem, and this will be the so this will be the integration the integration variable will become the beta roots, and the equations on them will be the, the the critical point equation for some function s known as the Yang Yang function. Now the the spectrum of the operator that shifts any so for example, if I want to know the spectrum of the operator that shifts. AI, well, that'll be just the partial of S with respect to the AI, because this will also happen to the integral if I shift AI. This, this, this will be, this will tell me what the, this will tell me what the, what the eigenvalues are. So in other words, the, the, 
the spectrum of the problem is, is the critical logos of some function. And the way I read off the eigenvalues of the operators is just to differentiate any of the parameters, that uh, the remaining function with respect to any of the parameters that tells me what the, what the eigenvalues are. And, and then more importantly, the map, so then you have, so this is, this is these are the beta equation, and what I have is I have a, an element in my physical space goes to a function, and that function I can restrict to the, uh, to the critical locus. What's it going to be? It's going to be a map from my Hilbert space to functions on the spectrum. If you think about if you think about what the spectral theorem says, it says spec to diagonalize an operator is to exhibit your Hilbert space as function on the spectrum of the operator. So this is this is the diagonalization. So in other words, this so that, that 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 somehow that that is that is spectral theorem in action here. Right? That that clear. So the main problems, therefore, is to so so this this beta equations. There's some art about how to write them, but it's uh, this is uh, this is not the problem somehow we solve in this particular <coughs> in this particular paper. The main problem for addressed here is to find eigenfunctions. So the title of the talk was not with the beta eigenvalues. The, the title of the talk was beta eigenfunctions. You find here in this. If, if you know if you the previous transparency sorry if you look at the previous transparency so this is here in this approach you first see the you first see the uh the eigenvalues and then you see the eigenfunctions and so the eigenvalues i'll explain how one gets the eigenvalues but the main issue is to to write that map you realize your physical space you, you want to map it to to functions in some auxiliary variables x which is so this is <coughs> this has a this has a this has a name. You want to write off shell beta function, which means it's it's some very nice function that, that if you plug in beta roots for x i, so it's gonna give you the eigenfunction. And um, and this so this is the problem we will solve in the in the setup of Nikratsova uh, Shindashvili. And what it does, it takes this problem and embeds embeds it um, in a priori very different physical problem, namely the study of, of supersymmetric gauge theories on, on manifolds of form Riemann surface cross S1. So, so this is... Um, okay, well, so now I will remind you, again, this is no, again, has, be, has to be probably considered textbook knowledge, but it's, it's good to remind people how it goes. So how this Nikrasov-Shadashvili correspondence goes? First, so in the gauge theory, there's a gauge group. And so I already told you what the, what the threefold, th it'll be a three-dimensional uh, gauge theory on the manifold of the form Riemann surface chrome this one. So now I have to tell you the gauge group and the, and the matter content. So the gauge group is a product of unitary groups. And the, the, the number of these groups is the rank of the is the rank of uh, is the rank of my Lie algebra, and the sizes of this group decodes so in, in um, among uh, beta, all beta operators and QKZ and so forth that commute with the Cartan of 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 my Lie algebra. So I can always restrict I can always restrict the problem to a fixed weight with respect to the Cartan. Which means, from the from the point of view of the spin chain, I can only restrict to the fixed number of spins up. So here's a here from. Uh, so if I think of all spins down as a vacuum, then four spins up means I, my weight changed by four units as I go from the vacuum. And so this will mean this will mean here my gauge group will be U4. In high rank, this is uh, the weight for my lattice, and so then you, if you go from the vacuum to a certain weight, this will tell you what the ranks of the gauge group should be. So this is now so the ranks of the groups. It's like the number of spins up in some high rank sense. <coughs> and then the beta roots are nothing but the elements in, in the maximal torus of this group. So there's no, there's no mystery where the beta roots are. So there's a gauge group, it has a maximal torus, and, and an element there denoted x1 through x whatever rank that is, and those are the beta roots. 
And the fact that we have to integrate over, uh, over, over this axis is just, it's just a restatement of a very old, a very familiar formula, integration formula of Hermann Weyl that says you how to project onto gauge invariant states or, or the group invariant states by integration over maximal torus. And in fact, the kind of integrals we saw for the solution of, of, um, of the QKZ, those are integrals very familiar in gauge theory. So these are somehow people. That type of integral, many of you have written for, for, for the longest time, and certainly they've had. This is the, in, in particular in this conference, they, they made an appearance in one of the first talks. So you know, Kentaro wrote them, so, something very similar in 2D context, some very similar integrals. So um, now the matter. So the matter will be uh, some collection of fundamental matter. So this is, it has to be a representation of this group. So this, this group has a fundamental representation. And that's, this, this could come in some number of copies, and so there'll be some flavor space, ten, so this will be tensored with some flavor space, which co traditionally called WI in the subject. And here is where these, so the variables AI are the elements, the diagonal matrices that act here. So the variables AI are just the <coughs> elements in the, in the, in the uh, maximal torus of a flavor symmetry group again. So in other words, every single parameter in the problem will be interpreted as an element in some torus. So, so this, is, this is very nice. And so the AIs, they live here. And then, and in addition, the, now this was to record, this is to, <coughs> this is to record how many copies of which, how many copies of which representation I take in this tensor product. And now to record the Lie algebra itself, uh, the Lie algebra itself is recorded in, in the collection of, um, of bifundamental. In other words, I take representation which is the uh, home from one space to another or the you know, dual of one tensor to another. And this, 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 um, this direct sum I take over all edges in some quiver. So quiver is just a collection of dots and arrows. So this is, <coughs> and that quiver you should think of uh, just really a first an arbitrary graph, and second it, general, it generalizes the notion of a Dinkin diagram. Except, except you should keep in mind that the notion of multiple edges here is, is different from there's some conventions for multiple edges in Dinkin diagrams. So this is this is different here. But uh, so in particular for any graph like this, there's some Lie algebra which have, you know, somehow you know, takes a long time to define, but it exists and. Uh, uh, for which this graph is kind of like a Dinkin diagram. You can, yeah. Um, it's not the cuts. It's not the cuts moody Lie algebra. So this is this is maybe you know, they should point this out. Uh, so that's that's uh, that's what that, that's where really Lie algebra appears. And then uh, for extra symmetry, we have to take the duals of all the spaces. So that's uh, that's uh, so that's the. Uh, uh, that's the gauge group in there, yeah. Yeah, if it's not simple lace, then this, then, 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 then it's not in this in this dictionary here. And then you have to do something else. You have to, you have to, a non simply lace diagram you should think of as a as a simple lace diagram with admissible automorphism it's like so that's uh, that's the way to do it <coughs> and so then to continue with this uh Nikras for the Shelly correspondence the Hilbert space of our quantum integral system that was that was the uh that that is identified with supply of line operators which is which are located at points in my so this is, has to be a line operator in the in uh, three dimensions, but it'll be in the point in the Riemann surface and, and wrapping this as this, the time S1. But somehow to, uh, to make things, well, I'm not gonna pretend I'm a physicist, uh, so <laughs> to, make, uh, to make math out of it. So what this thing is, is the equivalent K theory of, of an Akajima quiver variety, which in this case is interpreted as, as the Higgs branch of the modulo of IQ. So modulo, Higgs branch of the modulo of IQ is just, you um, you take the minimal of your potential and you mod it out by con I mean, all in the Higgs branch. All matter fields sit in a, are constant and sit in 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 the bottom of the well, and then you mod it out by the residual constant gauge transformation. 
And then, uh, so here, this will, this will amount to saying that I'll take the Nakajima quiver variety. And, and an encouraging, of course, uh, an encouraging sign already at the, at the development of this correspondence was what the, this equation K theory has been made uh, a module over a small quantum group previously by the work of Nakajima. So, uh, I mean, in some sense, this was the reason for the invention of the space is to provide a geometric, uh, a geometric realization of uh, modules over some quantum group. So this was, this was certainly a very important input in this, uh, in this correspondence. And the, uh, and what we will study mathematically, we will study the spaces. So we take this, this Nakajima quiver variety. I'm not going to define it. If you, it's, I mean, if you haven't seen it before, it, it's uh, you certainly. Uh, worthwhile thing to learn what it is. It's uh, it's a very useful variety in mathematics. So so that is some smooth algebraic variety, and that smooth algebraic variety is exhibited as a GIT quotient of something. And once you have a GIT quotient, then you have a notion of quasi map. It means a quasi map is is well, you can say it like this. So if I have a GIT quotient that sits as an open part and then the quotient stack. And so a quasi-map is a map to the stack that is generically goes to the stable part. Or or it's <laughs> maybe so if I have a if I have a if I have a quasi map to a JIT quotient is is a bundle of pre quotients with a section and that section goes generically to the stable part. So so this is the in gauge theory, these are the solutions of the vortex equation. This is why people why people study that. So in math, you you, you study that moduli space of quasi maps. In that moduli space, it, the, you study the numerative k theory in that moduli space. And when you when you sum up over all quasi maps, you you introduce a weighting by the degree, which is z to the degree of this map. And this is or this is degree generally amount l the index index of your uh, <coughs> This is where dependent of z comes in. So z in this language is like a Kähler parameter. It, it it couples to the degree of the quasi map as you sum over all quasi maps. And so the subject is is in terms of its formal development and it's also in its conceptual relation is very very similar to to um, to like Graham Witten theory and topological strings. Um, and in particular, it has it has a, a quantum K theory ring. Where the structure constants are, where you where you compute, you compute, you you in make some insertion at three points in your Riemann sphere, and you compute the the integral. So that that will be structure constants of that will give you the structure constant of the quantum K theory, and it has a quantum Q difference equation, which is similar to the quantum differential equation, in in Graham Witten theory, and that that quantum Q difference equation is, <coughs> in some sense, is even better than quantum differential equation. It 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 it, it records the response of your computation to having to introducing certain twists over. So if I have a, if I have a, uh, a quasi map from a from a from a, from projective line to uh, to my Nakajima quiver variety, I can twist it in various ways. If I take into account uh, automorphisms of my P1, so if my the variable Q is really just the variable in the multiplicative group that acts on my P1, so. In some sense, it's it's uh, this is this you see why it's unrelated to any other variables we've seen, and why it's a very natural variable. So there's some quantum Q difference equation you can define and study. And and to continue with insights of Nikolaus Rudashvili, they say, well, that quantum K theory that just, that that records the spectrum of uh, of the problem. Well, that is they identified with uh, with this. With the quotient of these uh, polynomials in, in, in beta roots by, by the beta equation. In other words, they, f they explain how the beta equation appears in this situation. You know, so, and, and the, uh, so this is, this, is a, this is a very basic, this is a very basic uh, fact, which is, uh, should be well known, but uh, uh, somehow experiment shows otherwise. This is, uh, to this day, you can find papers that uh, that conjecture things like this, whereas this is in fact proven a long time ago. And if you want to, if you want uh, um, 
a very good exposition of this of this uh, of the theory. I recommend this the paper by by uh, by Peter Peter and, and and his friends and and there's also follow up paper with Karatev, where where of course the emphasis is not on this statement, but the emphasis on the study study of Baxter Q operators in this context, but. Uh, and somehow. So um, anyway, this is this is this is this is known, and and what is also known is that is that so this is again the beta equations in principle you can write without any quantum group. It's uh, you don't need the quantum group to write the beta equations, but uh, you you need the quantum group to write Q K Z and other equations. And uh, and there's there's one of the outcome of of this um, geometric representation theory approach. So geometric representation theory means you construct the braiding so you construct the tensor products, you construct the R matrices geometrically. And uh, so this is what uh, David Molik and I have been doing for for some length of time. And so one of the outcomes of that is the identification of this quantum difference equation with with the QKZ and with the dynamical equations. And so this is uh, this is uh, this, this theorem tells you that um, tells you that tells you if you um, yeah, somehow if you have it gives you a geometric realization of the this QKZ equations and so then you can you can then in this framework then uh, try to solve it also geometrically. Uh, so now we're going to back pro the main problem of the beta ansatz is that so. The problem was that we had uh, the Hilbert space of, of a quantum integral system, and one we wanted to map it to uh, to off-shell beta function, which means the function with some auxiliary variables. So that was uh, that was a question mark. And now we will solve it after translating with the following problem. So this this is now identified with the current K theory of my Nakajima variety. This is supply of line operators. I mean, this is the this is the the ring of the my line, op line operators, and then uh, whereas this side, these are just these are these are um, these are variables in the maximal tor. So if I take symmetric polynomials, which f alpha is, uh, it's just I'm just this, the the object here is just representations of the gauge groups. So these are this is definitely a big supply of observables, and and we in in the gauge theory, and what we would like to do is we would like to map this. For every element here, we would like to find a canonical representative here. And there's another one. <laughs> this, is, this is like a, a basis in the space of all possible measurements you can take. This is the infinite supply of all possible measurements you, you can make. And you'd like to find some specific map going this way. And of course, there is a, there is a natural map going this way, which I'll explain in a second. And and uh, another Smirnov, so there's, there are two Smirnovs in this talk. There's a further Smirnov whose picture you saw in one of the first transparencies. And there's Andrei Smirnov who's, uh, who's, uh, who's a different Smirnov. And uh, not, not isomorphic in any secret way. So, uh, so this is, Smirnov has very nice formulas going this way in terms of quantum group language. Uh, so, but this is, his formulas, his formulas depend on both Z and Q as they should. Or whereas our formulas, Go this way, and they don't depend. They, so that that that, that off-shell beta function is independent of either Z or Q. So, so our formulas go this way, and there's no. So in other words, this is this is this is secretly you have an infinite infinity by finite matrix here, and Smirnov gives you some way to compute that matrix in terms of quantum group. And what we what we find also geometrically is is like an identity, not. not more or less an identity submatrix in this infinity by, by finite matrix. <coughs> uh, so, and, and we have several ex descriptions. I'm going to go over them in, in, in succession. Some of them make, so maybe this will be uh, interesting to uh, people not interested in gauge theories. There's, uh, there's some of them that make no explicit reference to gauge theories. <coughs> and so, so maybe I'll just to reiterate is that <coughs> This this dictionary that translates translates uh, the maps going this or this way that that, inf that infinity by finite matrix is uh, is given by uh, by just two point function you take you take your uh, p1 
and uh, we'll take it accurately with respect to rotation. So they'll have two fixed points, zero and infinity. And at these two points, at one fixed point, we would like to put an insertion that comes from K theory of equivalent K theory of Nakajima variety. At, at the other point, we will take a descendant insertion, a supersymmetric Wilson line, if you want, or uh, just says if in the moduli spaces of quasi maps, there are some universal bundles. These universal bundles you can uh, restrict to to uh, to this point, and then take some characteristic classes. This would be this will be an infinite supply of various uh, various insertions you can put at this point. So then you take this two-point function, you get the infinity by finite matrix. <coughs> and now maybe maybe <coughs> maybe again to state uh, in a more uh, in a more um, in a more um, categorical way, here at this point we would like to insert something that comes from uh, from the key theory of, of Nakajima query variety, like uh, that Nakajima query variety sits, it is a stable locus inside some stack. And uh, so here's a, that, that K theory of that is some finite dimensional my of Hansons. Uh, whereas, whereas here I can put uh, an arbitrary K theory class coming from the stack. It's just, it's just representations of the group. It's a quotient by some group, but just representation of that group. That's just that's just the K theory of my stack. So this is <coughs> this is uh, this is a way to pair this and that, and that that's uh, what we're going to do. Uh, and maybe I should explain also. This is this is maybe slightly unfamiliar to to practitioners on the physics side. Is how do you actually impose a condition? So if you have a, a quasi map, is a map. Again, a quasi map is a map to the stack that's generically stable. So how do you going to impose? It means it has some points. So those these crosses are some points in the domain of the quasi map that where it goes unstable. And so, uh, and if you'd like, if you have a point in your in, your, in the source, then uh, you can't really evaluate. If you evaluate at that point, you're only going to go to the stack. You're not going to go to the to the stable locus. But there is a standard way in algebraic geometry how to deal with it, namely, if a singularity, if a singularity, uh, if a singularity approaches a point where I evaluate, all I do is I just bubble off. I mean, so my my domain, my well, space in this case, uh, the space of the sp the space part of the space time of of uh, my supersymmetric gauge theory <coughs> will develop that sausage of will bubble off that sausage of. Of things where, where at the end of it, we'll be sitting my new marked point, and then, <coughs> and then uh, this is where I evaluate. So uh, I mean, very similar approaches, very similar things have been suggested in like four di four dimensional gauge theory the longest time ago. Instead of dealing with, if you'd like to avoid having uh, having uh, a point like instantons, and you can try to bubble up, bubble up, bubble you know, somehow put instantons on some kind of bubble as as a point like instanton develop. And here, here we, here we, all we need is to avoid a point like instant on at this one marked point. So all we need is a sausage. So we don't need any kind of trees or anything like that. And so, <coughs> so after the discussion, so this is, uh, there is this, 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 this explains how. Sorry. This explains how I'm going to pair uh, an element of the K theory of my Nakajima variety with an element of the K theory of the stack. Or uh, then <laughs> description number one. It's not the description. It's just <laughs> it's, it, you know it just says what are we going to do? We're going to find an equivalent descendant insertion for any relative insertion. So I'm not saying how to do it, but it just says you know this is what we're going to do. This will solve the problem. So this is this this beta this uh, this uh, uh <coughs> finding this beta uh, off shell beta. Eigenfunction. If I mean, if we solve this problem, we will th that formula will give us this off-shell beta eigenfunction. Um, and one solution is is maybe more geometrical, is that in fact that thing is given by a uh, by a stable envelope map. So there's a <coughs> there's a map which is uh, so. I mean, Halpern and Leister and other people have a very general theory. Uh, for uh, for maps like this, where you try to map, in fact, the embed the the derived category of the stable locus into the into the derived category of the stack, but uh, the uh, the symplectic 
the symplectic uh, nature of the situation, since we took a, a vector representation and it's dual, the symplectic nature of the situation lets you lets you find um, lets you find uh, um, an extension that corresponds not to uh, not to uh, one-dimensional torus, but a multi-dimensional torus, which is which is uh, which is uh, which is will will not be there in general, but so this is <coughs> so this is there's some again so this is this is this is and and the way <coughs> this is very closely related to uh, to what we've seen in Kintara's talk. I mean, like I said, this kind of thing so it can be the existence here can be proven in complete generality for an arbitrary Nakajima variety that can be constructed, and in fact, so this is. <coughs> It's so like in the paper, if you ever open the paper, in the paper, me and I, we use, we use a, a, a slick trick to avoid this construction. We, we use some other construction that in particular outputs this. So but it's the, the construction, you, you embed the whole stack. It is a quotient stack in some bigger Nakajima variety. So this, there's some. And then you only use table envelopes for Nakajima varieties themselves. You never have to deal with stacks. So this is uh, there's some trick we use, but anyway, there's some theory like this, and in fact, it connects to um, the way it, it connects very nicely with the notion of so. So in in a previous paper, me and I studied um, boundary conditions in three-dimensional gauge theory, which is again very 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 closely related to objects that um, that appeared in Kitaro's talk in two dimensions. So in three dimensions, the the kind of the kind of boundary we'd like to consider is that if I cut out if I cut out our disk uh, out of my Riemann surface, and then uh, then the boundary becomes that disk the, the boundary becomes the torus that disk cross uh, cross the time circle, and the uh, the variable q which I have in the problem could be interpreted as a modulus of that of that torus. And then, so the, the 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 stable envelopes that that describe it can be interpreted as boundary condition. The elliptic stable envelopes. The elliptic stable envelopes is some elliptic thing w to which you marry your gauge theory on the boundary on the boundary of your spacetime. And so then, uh, the, 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 this object you can take the limit. So the, the, you know, there's some objects we studied called elliptic stable envelopes. If you degenerate the torus. In other words, you, you shrink that boundary condition to a line operator that uh, that will that will precisely give what we want in this beta on that situation. Maybe. Okay. So, and our final. So this is this is again. This is maybe. For for those of you in the subject, this 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 this, this is, I hope this is informative. But for those of you outside, here's a formula. And the formula is very simple, in fact. So the formula makes no reference to anything I've discussed so far. It just says so. I now let's just let's just let's just backtrack all the way to the first slide. Is that <coughs> is that uh, so? I have some vector in a representation of my quantum group. And now I need a function. Of a bunch of variables, and how we're going to get that function? I take I'm going to braid that state with the vacuum in in a tensor product of a fundamental representation, each value that's on beta root. So the the uh, the how many fundamental representation I have to take? This is dictated by the weight by the weight of this vector. So this this vector had a certain weight with respect to the Cartan that 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 uh, uh, that that weight determines how many beta roots I'm going to have of which beta roots have each beta root has its, uh, is labeled by um, by uh, a vertex in the Dinkin diagram. So uh, a weight tells me how many beta root of which flavor I have to take, uh, and then uh, so this I'll take fundamental representation of this thing. Then I then I braid this and I take the matrix element. This on this side is the vacuum, and on this side, this is this is the only kind of new thing. Here you take a specific eigenvector of of loops into Cartan. 
So loops into Cartan is a commutative subalgebra inside of my quantum group. This can be diagonalized. There's some formulas for how to do it. And you can take, so you can take specific eigenvector here, and if you take that braiding, this will be, this will take your element alpha. You know, this matrix element of the R matrix takes alpha to a function. And that function is the off-shell beta hang function. And, and what you think if you was in the case of, in the case of uh, classical spin one half beta ansatz, what is going to say? It's going to say that this will be uh, a six vertex uh, model partition function with some boundary condition alpha. Here we'll have all spins down. Here all spins down. And here, but just by the weight consideration, this, this side will be all spins up. And so then, then, then since I told the, the, well, the matrix elements of, a, of an R matrix, these are elements in my, uh, in my quantum group. And in particular, the map that takes, that takes spin down to spin up is, is what's called the B in the quantum group, the B operator. So that, that, that map just specializes to a product of B operator evaluated beta roots at, uh, applied to the vacuum. So that's the, for those of you who have uh, seen the textbooks, this is the, this is the formula. And you can similarly see that this formula is going to specialize to this, um, what's it called? Nested beta ansatz for, um, for, for JLN. But, uh, but it's not going to specialize to anything known for like E, Lie algebras, because there's no formula for E. Well, yeah. And on finite infinite dimensional so far. And, and finally, there's a formula. So, uh, so, this you know from the from the style of this presentation, you may not you know you may not suspect that this is a very formal oriented. I mean, the subject is very formal, grounded in formulas, and in particular, we give for all quivers of affine type, which is the most for for applications in enumerative geometry, because. Um, quivers of affine type, they directly related, the computations there are directly related to computations in this K theoretic Donaldson Thomas theories, which is uh, of, it's, uh, of, of, of great interest in, well, for some of us in the new geometry. And so for quivers of affine type, we give explicit formulas for what this beta off shell beta functions are. So there's, if you can, there's, they're, they're, they're what's called tabellinization formulas, means, so, not gonna, I don't expect you to read, but if you look at section 3.2, there'll be formulas of the kind that this off-shell beta function is, is a symmetrization of some explicit product. Uh, that product is given by some, exp some explicit terms. This generalizes, this will generalize Baxter's formula for, for SLT. So this is, uh, so in other words, you wanna look for formulas, look on section, for examples, what this thing says. How you compute this, you look in section 3.2. Now I want to conclude is that <coughs> if you think of this, this formula, so maybe we'll go here. This formula here involved, so it only involved the ingredient that were present there from the very beginning. Except I had to I mean maybe with one with one, you can ask what is the how do I know which, which representations are fundamental? So then then so that that will be that will be a, a, a deep question here, but in principle, there's a formula which is involves no no somehow no gauge theories, no geometric interpretation, no Nakajima varieties, and you can ask from the point of, from the point of practical point of view, why is this why why is geometry is just somehow so much more powerful in proving formulas like this than uh, then, then somehow direct. I mean, in the answer, you have a you have a difference equation. I mean, it's a difference equation. You try to solve it by an integral, and and so you know it's a question in 19th century math because you you have to show that this uh, you know, look, in the integration there's some cancellation, there's some poles, there's some residues, and so in principle any such any such uh, any such computation can be in principle done. Uh, uh, why is this? Uh, why is it so much easier to do it in geometrically, or to do it within the framework of this um, supersymmetric gauge theories? Is well, there, I've listed some some reasons, which purely practical reasons. Is that first of all, it lets you be until the very end. It lets you be very inexplicit about. I mean. It, Sufficiently inexplicit about the nature of the quantum. Like, like we don't even need the uh, 
the problem with which I mean, somehow the problem that appeared in Kevin's talk uh, uh, um, yesterday was, for example, writing down uh, explicit relations in the quantum group. And truth be told, for any for anything here, you don't need to know explicit relations. I mean, this is you know this is it's like it's like asking you for knowledge break variety, asking for explicit equations that define it. You know, sometimes it's convenient, but for for most constructions, you, you don't need that. So, for example, <coughs> you know, you, you could work it out. There's a way to work it out, but you don't need to know what they are. Uh, and so, again, so when you write, when you solve the, um, when you solve the uh, difference equation uh, uh, by an integral, there is a notoriously thorny problem of selecting the contour of integration. And this is people, uh, so this is, <coughs> from geometrical perspective, it just literally gives you a contour of integration. So you don't, you don't need to think about anything about it. And, 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 and maybe the most, again, for the practitioners, I mean, somehow, there's no, there's no uh, tool I know of which is, as powerful as geometric consideration to show that the poles in some expression cancel. So if, you, if I have, if I have a, a, a compact, a compact, uh, you know, somehow you compute the Euler consistency with something compactly supported in Ecrain K theory, then if I write it by the localization, that will be a rational function, but uh, that rational function will will in fact be a polynomial. And similarly, if I have a, a you know, if I can, if I have any, 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 any given Somehow, it, I mean, if I have some rational function, I can, I can ask. Even if I have some non-compactness, then I can still, I can still argue that some poles are absent if I, uh, on a similar, on a similar ground. So there's no, there's nothing, remotely resembling this in, in its, in its power, because if you have, in the end, when you have a, when you have this integral of some expressions, there's some. I said, if, if, uh, people, of course, people for JLN, people really did this computation and really did show that this is, this is, uh, this is, this, this solves the equation. But this is, uh, this is completely unthinkable to, to do it in ge complete generality because I mean, just, just, just too hard. So, um, mm. all right, that's uh, that's my transparency and that's uh, that's my talk. Yeah, thanks. <laughs>